welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you and congratulations on your book launch and the uh, immediate success you've had. (laughs) Thank you so much, Nikki. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, let's dive right in. So let's start with the, um, you know, just introducing you to our audience and and sharing with them, you know, what your story is and uh, what you've learned in your journey. Absolutely. Well, I am currently um, executive recruiter and partner at a firm called O'Connell Group, which is an executive recruiting firm specializing in marketing and market research. And been here 25 years, but never in the in my wildest dreams did I think I would end up here. So my journey is I went to Kellogg Business School, absolutely mm-hmm. loved it, uh, moved into brand, consumer packaged goods, was there for a decade working at companies like Kraft and J&J, Herman Miller Furniture Company and a division of Nestle Purina yeah. when my company was sold and um, out of the blue, and we had moved to St. Louis, and my husband and I decided we wanted to raise our kids here. Mm -hmm. And in my world of CPG, there were certain things that I was truly exceptional at, building relationships, working with teams, absolutely loved it. There were other things that didn't come as naturally, and Mm -hmm. I wasn't as good at. And so when I was at this transition point, Mm -hmm. um, I interviewed for other marketing jobs because that was natural and easy. And I got a couple offers, um, but I also called my favorite recruiter and said, get me a job in St. Louis. We are not moving. And he threw out, come work for me, Um, Mm. (laughs) which came out of the blue. I will say Brian and I had an amazing relationship. He had become a mentor and a friend and almost a big brother. So when that happened, I really took a step back and thought, what do I love doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and I took out two sheets of paper and wrote down on one, everything I loved and everything I didn't love. And then I honed down to top 10. And what became very evident to me was I love the people part. Mm. But some of the uh, analytics and the politics and the other things I really didn't like. They made me crazy uncomfortable. And so with that in hand, I talked to some mentors and asked them their advice because as I thought about the marketing jobs, going to the director level made me really uncomfortable. Most Mm. people want to get promoted. I love the brand manager job, but the director job really shifted to much more analytics, politicking, Mm -hmm. and all those things that weren't as natural. So talking to mentors, they said, we think you'd be great and If you go and do it for a year and don't love it, you can always come back. There you go. And so I decided to take the leap. I worked remote. And from day one, Nikki, it felt like breathing. It felt so natural. (laughs) So natural, so fun. I would tell my husband, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. (laughs) You know, talking to friends every day. And so I fell into this role and this field that fit me like a glove. Wow. So that's kind of my story. That's incredible. But, but it also highlights the fact that you, um, you know, took inventory of your own strengths and passion, that yeah. exercise of looking at what do I love and what do I not love? Yeah. Um, really being able to hone in what drives you um, and then having the courage to pursue that, <laughs> not just saying, okay, I know it, but now I'm not going to do anything about it because change is hard. I think that's terrific. Yeah, it was interesting because my family, my husband was supportive. My family was baffled. I had gone to a top business school and here I was going to be a headhunter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it was interesting because while I was really successful, I didn't really know why until about a decade into my career, my boss had us read a book, Discover Your Sales Strength and Take the Strength Finders Test. Mm. And all of my top strengths, that's when the aha and the light bulb went off, all of my strengths were tied to people. Wow. And I loved their message 
which was figure out your strengths and go into careers that will leverage them and you will be successful and happy. And that has been my message as I counsel people throughout their careers, that that is the core. Wow. That's so true. And I think anyone who has either, um, you know, known their strengths, eventually discover their strengths and then follow that to, you know, find that right fit career can speak from experience. I mean, what you say, it feels like breathing is so true because it really does. I mean, it feels effortless. Right. And and there's no impatience to get anywhere because you're just enjoying the journey. And you can make a bigger difference because you're really good at what you do. There you go. Um, And so, you know, what compelled you to then write a book? Great question. So um, I've been thinking about writing a book for 15 years. And the idea came to me when a friend of mine who was head of career placement at Washington University asked me to come to the school and talk to the business school students. And WashU has a great career center. And yet I have gone two or three times a year to WashU and the kids are hungry for the knowledge. And they are really excited about the information I share about how to do interview prep, how to negotiate, how to network. Um, And so that started it. Then I also have three kids who are either gone through college or still in college. And I've been to all their schools and done similar things. And they've been lucky in that they've gone to top liberal arts schools. Again, great career centers. But I started thinking, man, think about all the other schools that don't have well-funded and how great the need is. Um, And so that started me when my youngest went to college, I worked with a personal coach. And what came out of that was that I really wanted to leave a legacy. I love my job, but I can only talk to so many people in a day. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to trans, you know, to give the information to a broader group. And it's for not just college kids, graduates, career changers. It's for people who are looking to optimize their career and helping them figure out how to get there and give them the tools to to achieve their goals. Yeah, I mean, um, what challenges you shared are really universal at all Mm -hmm. career stages. I I mean, I've come across friends and colleagues that are uh, 20 years into their career, but they're comfortable in their successes. And yet when it's time to interview for a new opportunity or find a new opportunity, there's a nervousness because, well, it's been six years since the last time I looked for a job. Yeah, I have no yeah. idea what to do. Um, and, and so these are skills that whether you're early in your career or mid-career or fairly experienced, they're important skills to have. Um, so speaking of which, um, let's dive into, you know, the, the core principles um, that, and the framework that you teach in the book. And um, first off, tell us what is the specific big question that your book is providing an answer to? So the book really provides the answer of you know, what are my, you know, how do I figure out my strengths and what's critical? So how do I figure out my strengths and where I might leverage them? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the second thing is really what are the phases of my career and what should I be focusing Mm -hmm. on in each phase? And so those are two of the probably four key strategic Mm -hmm. areas, but I think critical for people to be successful and set themselves up for future success. There you go. So, I mean, in essence, it's really about how do I ignite my career, which is your book <laughs> title as well as, you know, how do I discover, you know, the right one, the right path, and then yes. how do I, you know, take it to the next level? So, yeah. And, and Nikki, you know, as, as I don't know about you, but I know people who have gone to law school or <laughs> are following in the family tradition mm-hmm. and they're miserable. You know, they did it because they're quote unquote supposed to. Right. And when those folks take a step back and really assess themselves personally Mm -hmm. and what are my innate strengths? And I, I, there are various ways you can do Mm -hmm. that. You can talk to professors or coaches or family. You can do what I did with the sheets of paper. You can reach out to your career center or mentors or 
The other thing is there are online tests and mm-hmm. two that I love. One is Strength Finders that I mentioned. The other one is one called You Science that has you play nine computer games. And from that, it can map out what your brain's strengths are and help you figure out what careers they wow. would be leveraged effectively in. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I was thinking about this conversation this weekend and I gave my son for his birthday a 2000 piece puzzle and he wanted me to sit down and do it with him. And I am awful with puzzles. I am not <laughs> like, but I can separate the colors and, 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 <laughs> and make it, you know, set the stage. So I can do the early stage. He's yeah. really good at puzzles. And so it's actually thought that was a great analogy of figuring yeah. out where your strengths allow you to add value because I can stare at that puzzle for four hours. And if I get one piece in, I'm great, but I can add value other ways. So it's really key, I think. And for kids coming out of college or people who are not satisfied in their career to do that Mm self-assessment because it's critical. It's like you said, when you find it, when you find the right career that leverages your strengths, Mm -hmm. fun, it's easy, and it's rewarding. And I think that's what we all want. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, um, there are so many people who go through their entire careers um, somewhat miserable. You know, if they're absolutely yeah. miserable, they're probably more motivated to change. But when it's just tolerable, that's almost the worst position to be in because it's not yeah. so bad that you want to quit. But yes. it's not great that you're fully in alignment with your core. Yeah. And it just seems like such a waste of talent and potential to be in that position. And yet fear gets in the way. You know, what if yes. I leave what I know and go into something that is new and different and un- that I'm unproven in? What if right. I now don't have continuity and certainty of income, what do I do? So how would you guide someone going through those kind of fears and concern about switching lanes, if you will? Yeah. um, And that ties into my book um, in terms of phases of career. Mm -hmm. And and what you're saying is, so I believe there are three phases of any career. It doesn't matter the industry. There's the learn, there's the do, and there's the leverage. And at the learning phase, everything is new. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. It takes you a really long time because you've never done it before. But after you do it a couple times, it becomes second nature. Um, So the person you're talking about is in the doing phase, Mm -hmm. but they're not happy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're uncomfortable and they're miserable. Um, And so what I would tell them to do is to really take that step back and write that chart out of what do you love and Mm -hmm. what do you not love? Take one of these online tests and use those two things as North Star because there likely are many fields that will leverage some of what you've already learned. Mm-hmm. So that you can switch to a new career and not be at the beginning of the learning phase, but at the midpoint, because many of your skills transfer over exceptionally well, mm-hmm. but it's putting you on a path that's going to be much more aligned with who you are and where you'll be successful. So I, I tell people, and we have people who are lawyers or consultants who are miserable, who switch over to CPG. And I'm always like, your career is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Our goal is to get you on the right track. And yes, you might have to take two steps forward to make one step, you know, to go forward and where you want to go. But it's a long career that you have ahead of you. And you'd much rather be in some place where you're going to be successful and happy and thrive. So it may be worth it for the short term to take a little bit of a decrease in compensation, like you said, but your chances of moving up are going to be so much higher because you're going to deliver so much more success. So that's kind of what I tell people. Mm. Let's um, uh, dig into your framework that you just referenced, the learn to leverage. Um, Explain that to us. Yeah. So learn phase is, as I said, it's where you're new and you've not done anything. And at this learn phase, I really believe it's critical to go to the best company you can get to. And whether it's the, you know, the tier A company, 
or whether it's a mid-tier, but you're learning from people who have been trained in best practices, that's what you want to focus at this point. If, if you think about it, you are building the foundation for your career and you mm-hmm. want that foundation to be as sturdy as possible. Um, an analogy that I use for my candidates is what you're doing at the learning phase is you are building tools and mm-hmm. your goal is to build really quality tools. Mm-hmm. To the doing phase, it's when you've built that skill set. And so you've built those tools and you know what you're doing. You Mm -hmm. no longer need somebody looking over your shoulder telling you what to do. So in the marketing world, at the learning phase, you're an assistant or associate. You have a brand manager who is overseeing you. At the doing phase, you are now that brand manager Mm -hmm. and you are focused on building your business. And so at the doing phase, you... It's still great to work for really good people because you're still learning, but it's not quite as critical. So maybe you go to a little bit of a smaller company where you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond, Mm -hmm. but your goal is to take those tools and to build something. And and with the analogy, I say you got to build a house and actually lots of different houses with different floor plans. So you've Mm -hmm. got to do over and over and over again, make mistakes, course correct, learn how to do exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. After you've done that, you then shift to the leveraging phase. And the leveraging Mm -hmm. phase is when you're now that expert who knows best practices and you are teaching other people. So much of what you do at the learning phase, it might be the director, the VP or above, you are getting work done through other people. Mm -hmm. And at the leveraging phase, it's interesting. Many people um, innately don't know how to manage people well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to let go. Well, even that shift of going from individual contributor to yes. manager leader, yes. that letting go of control, learning the art of delegation, you know, yes. driving accountability. I mean, there's just so many things that uh, oftentimes are not even taught in the workplace. You kind of just fall, you get promoted and then yes. you go, <laughs> figure it out. Right. And, and so many people, I tell people to take classes, to reach out to bosses who they loved and ask them for best practices and mm-hmm. if they can help guide them because it's hard to be a great manager. But at the leveraging phase, it's really critical to excel. And, and you're leveraging people, but you're also leveraging your expertise throughout the organization at that phase. And, mm-hmm. and you may add value other ways than versus just driving your business. So... The learning phase, you're, you're building these tools, quality tools. The doing phase, you are building houses. And the leveraging phase, you're kind of the general manager mm-hmm. who is overseeing these builders. So right. those are the three phases. Does not matter the industry. They are consistent. But the other thing I will say is for people starting out in their career, while you know, a lot of people have passions and they want to go to companies whose values align or they're passionate about the product. Mm -hmm. I get that. But at this point in your career, it's much more important to go to top tier where you can learn best practices. And that allows you down the road to align your passions with your experience. That's that's really great guidance because if you don't learn the foundation well at the early stage or don't focus on right. learning, you get weaker as you progress through your career in the do and yes. the research phase. Um, Absolutely. The foundation is really key. And I think that mindset of even though you've graduated from college, you're still a student. You're just learning mm-hmm. the competencies yeah. in your career. Very true. What and, are... And- Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say one other thing, Nikki, is a past boss of mine, a gentleman named Bob Eckert, who was CEO of Mattel, used to say, when you know how to do 80% of your job without thinking, it's time to move because you got to be a continuous learner Mm -hmm. to continue to grow and develop. And I think that's also very true. That is um, so powerful, and especially in this day and age where things are cho- changing so fast that if yeah. you're not constantly learning, you're already behind. Yeah. Um, so um, given that you have, I, I know you've helped thousands of people you know, find their dream careers and uh, find the right roles for them, what are some of the things that you see you know, are uh, hallmarks of those that get it right and do well? and those that don't and get stuck? I think that's a great question. Um, 
those who get it right um, and, and are the real superstars are the people who focus on both building the business, but the team as well. Mm. And it's that one-two punch that they realize that their people, without their people and their people's passion and focus, they'll never be successful. So, you know, there are a lot of bad bosses out there. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, I've had one and I know how absolutely miserable it is. Mm -hmm. But if somebody can excel running a business and knowing how strategically to align it, but also to inspire their team and set their team up for success and really um, focus on those two, those are the people that I've seen are most successful in their career long term. And what about um, from a, let's talk about sort of, you know, when you're in that transition phase, we're trying to find something that's right for you. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there's a lot of people in the market right now, in fact, um, just given the economy and the impact of, uh, you know, the pandemic and so forth that are um, struggling. They're, you know, either have lost their jobs or, they're somewhat, you know, their jobs are less secure now and they're nervous about being in the job market with so many uh, people all looking at the same time. Yeah. There's a level of desperation that comes in, you know, where you're focused just on, you know, I want to secure my income. I'll take anything just to have financial security. Sure. How would you guide them? Um, and you're right. I'm talking to a lot of people in the same situation. And, and there are a couple things uh, that I would say. First of all, I tell people, take a breath. Because mm-hmm. we are really, li- we're living through biblical times. And, mm-hmm. and we forget that. Um, and the world has turned upside down. So the norms that I would have said a year ago, yeah, kind of have gone up in smoke. Um, so the couple things that I do is I tell people, first of all, be productive and continue to learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you can't find a role right now, take a class in an area that you want to continue to gain expertise in. And marketing, it might be digital or e-commerce. You may not be able to get the perfect job today, but getting a job where you can excel at the job and continue to build your skill set can set you up tomorrow when the pandemic lifts to leverage that to get your perfect job. So again, it may be stepping stones today and that's okay. The world knows what's going on. The world knows that there have been all these furloughs and laid off and certain industries are underwater. Right. Companies are going, you know, chapter 11 all over the place. So take a deep breath and do what you have to do to survive. But you know, even if you go work at McDonald's or wherever, Starbucks, do an exceptional job and learn customer service and learn how to connect with your consumer. And then the other thing that I'm telling people is, you know, if you're doing something like that, but still want to get other experience, reach out to mentors, re- network in the marketplace, reach out to family, friends, and talk about, are there things at your company that need to be done where I could be an intern paid or not paid? I'm looking for the experience. I'm looking to build my resume so that as we come out of it, I can leverage that experience. Right. So it, it's the so bottom line is the one thing not to do is do nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Do something, it. take action, yes. learn, get experience, get exposed to new industries, new opportunities, but keep moving forward. Don't allow yeah. It that back to stall you. Absolutely. And I'll give a quick example. Um, A family friend is a rising sophomore in college and her internship blew up. And so she was trying to figure out what to do. And she ended up realizing with the pandemic, a lot of people are emptying their closets. They're they're using the time to get rid of stuff. And she also realized that coming out of this, there are a lot of women who don't have professional attire. And so she decided she was going to put together a clothing drive, reach out to all these people in St. Louis and say, as you're emptying your closet, you know, I'd like to get this. I'm going to take it over to these three P places that will then distribute it to women in need, as well as helping them work on their resume and everything else. So she's not getting any money out of it. But if you think about what it shows, it shows initiative, it shows great creativity, project management, and it's going to set her up very well for the future. 
Yeah. And so it, it's a great- it shows, um, you know, a mindset of growth and contribution that is incredible. Absolutely. So yeah. that's, a, that's a great example. Um, when, you know, one of the scenarios I'm hearing about over and over again is people that um, are experienced perhaps mid-career and Mm -hmm. for the first time are finding themselves in this predicament where they're having to look for a job. They might have been very successful where they were either set in a a role or in a company that they loved doing what they love um, or they got poached or, you know, um, hired by a competitor, never really had to look, right? And suddenly a decade or two later, they're in this position where they're now having to actually look for a job and they have no idea where to start. Um, Whether it is a resume that's terribly outdated, a LinkedIn profile that has fallen by the wayside, and interview skills that are almost non-existent. Yes. Can you give us some very practical tips? I know you have some tactical guideline uh, steps in your book as well, but can you give yes. us some of those, um, you know, valuable techniques and tips that people can apply from, you know, preparing their profile to preparing for the interview? Um, Absolutely. From that? So the first thing, and I say this about 10 times in my book is nobody can do the work for you. Mm. You know, you've got to put in the time and the effort and looking for a job and finding a job is hard work, but you're investing in yourself. So that's the first thing I'll say. Um, So when it comes to resumes, Mm -hmm. I don't believe in fancy resumes and creative resumes. I am a big believer in clean and clear, easy to read. Um, If you think about it, a resume is kind of like a newspaper. You Mm -hmm. have the headline and then you have the body copy. And the headline Mm -hmm. is your schooling and where you worked and what your titles were. And those are the things that people look at to decide, do I want to read further? Mm -hmm. So your resume has to be easy to see those things. It's got to be consistent. I also am a huge believer in bullet points versus paragraphs. Paragraphs are hard to work through. And if you get somebody looking at your resume, if you get eight seconds, you're great. So simple and clean and clear and not fancy. You want to articulate what you've done and the results you've delivered because people are looking for that one-two punch. So that's kind of on the resume section. Um, On the net, like networking is another thing that I think is critical in the job search, especially if somebody has been in the workforce a long time, they have a lot of people that they have, worked with in the past or have mentors. And I am a huge believer in networking throughout your career. It's almost like you need to, you need to treat it as a muscle and -hmm. continue to work it so that when you are looking for a job, Mm -hmm. you have those relationships, but reach out to mentors, reach out to people you've worked with, pay attention on LinkedIn. And as you see posts that really resonate with you, write a note and on their post, but then also message them and say, hey, what you wrote was really great and resonated with me. Would you mind spending 15 minutes with me? Mm. As I'd love to understand your journey. Um, On networking, Nikki, also, I really believe it's got to be a two-way street. If you reach out to somebody and say, hey, can you get me a job? You're going to turn them off and they're going to want nothing to do with you. But if you position it as, can you share your journey and your learnings with me? And I would love your advice. And can I keep you up to date on my career? Then Mm -hmm. it becomes a two-way street. So Mm -hmm. networking, I think, is critical. Um, do you want me to just keep going? Yeah, keep going. Okay. So the third thing is on how to apply for a job. Um, you know, you see these posts and people are like, yeah, I'm going to push that button. And uh, in fact, that is, is almost the kiss of death, right? Because yes. it, it really comes from a place of desperation where you're nervous about not getting a job. You're looking at every job out there has yes. 600 you know, applicants and you think, my right. gosh, it's been, that job was posted, you know, two hours ago and there's 600 applicants. I don't have yes. a shot at all. And you get nervous and you just think volume is going to make a difference. I'm just going to click more and hopefully yes. one of them <laughs> works. And, and you know, that's the wrong strategy. So what's apps, the- Yeah, that you were so right. And, and I talk about um, how to apply in terms of odds and pushing that button is the lowest odd. 
Yeah. I mean, in reality, especially the more major corporations, they're getting thousands and thousands of resumes and they don't look at them. What they do is they either use AI, artificial intelligence, or they have an applicant tracking system that scans through and brings the resumes that have the key skills on them to the top. So low, low chance mm-hmm. when you're applying online. So I would tell you, you only do that as the last ditch effort. Right. Otherwise, take a breath. So if you see a job that you're excited about, the first thing I would tell you to do is go look on LinkedIn and see if you know anybody who works there. Mm-hmm. You know, either somebody who you've worked with in the past, which is best case, or somebody you've networked with and reach out to them to ask them if they'd be willing to advocate for you and deliver your resume to the hiring manager because that has a much greater likelihood mm-hmm. of getting you in the door and seen by an actual human. So that's one way. An even better way is if there's an executive recruiter working on that search, they have been hired by the company and they have direct access to the hiring manager and the human resources people who are running that search. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is if you have executive recruiter who is quality, and I'll be the first to say there are some out there that are not, Mm -hmm. but you know somebody who's good, who listens to you, wants to understand your career path, is a mentor. If you have somebody like that who's working on the job or knows senior leaders and get permission to send you in, that mm-hmm. is the very best odds. And if mm-hmm. you can do that, plus have somebody who you have worked with in the past, um, after the recruiter who sent you in, advocate on, your, pa- on your, you know, your candidacy based on both them knowing you as well as seeing you work, that's what I call the one-two punch. That is the highest odds of all that you're going to get a day in court. There you go. Um, you know, so let's say I now have the opportunity to meet a recruiter or present myself to a recruiter. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, the recruiters themselves in some ways can be gatekeepers because obviously yes. their own reputation resides on that with the companies that they're placing candidates with. Yeah. Um, how do I, as a candidate, make sure that I'm doing enough of my groundwork to not to, to have the best chances in with the recruiter who can represent me and open doors for me? Um, That's a great question. So I would tell you, the first thing is take recruiter calls Mm -hmm. and then find the two or three that you want in your corner long-term and share with them, you know, your role, what you've done, your goals, your aspirations, your preferences on geography, your preferences on culture, so that they have you top of mind. Right. Um, And so when that role, bullseye role comes out, that they know to reach out to you. The other thing is, as you said, recruiters are gatekeepers. When I'm the client, I'm not going to send somebody who's not right for the role. But I'm also going to tell you that. I'm going to say, look, this is not the right role for you. And this is why, you know, they want somebody with over-the-counter drugs experience and you have all food. And so even if we sent you in, it would be, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, But they may shift and say, here are other clients that I'm working on. So staying in touch and making sure they're updated with your information, making sure you work with them to build a world-class resume that represents you well Mm -hmm. um, is the best way to effectively work with recruiters. Mm. So much of uh, what you're describing um, really sounds like you have to think of yourself as a brand and it's getting clear about what the differentiators of the brand are, where your brand plays well, in which market your brand is most likely to succeed. Um, So that's where the whole strengths um, and passions comes in. But once you know that, um, you really have to sort of, um, you know, distinguish yourself by being able to tell the brand story and that's your mm-hmm. resume, your LinkedIn profile and so forth. Get clear, who are you targeting? What's your core message? What are, what's the value and the impact you will create? Why should someone choose you? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then being able to really build advocacy and that's whether it's the recruiters, whether it's the community at large, you're building advocacy for your brand and um, really standing for the value um, you know, that you deserve. 
And I think you are absolutely right. And it's it's with the recruiter. But then, you know, what happens is that, you know, after you've applied, now you have you have interviews. So now you got to interview, you know, do your interview prep. And I am a huge believer that not doing your interview prep is like going to Harvard and leaving before that last class and, and walking away. So you've done all this work to get to this point. So with interview prep, I believe you're right. You've got to understand yourself and be able to articulate your strengths and your skills um, so that they're believable and memorable. And, you know, I, you know, for everybody from chief marketing officers to kids coming out of college, I take them through the same interview prep and it's really helping them crystallize their story. And if somebody asks you, what are your strengths? What are your achievements? And you rattle them off and I ask them 10 minutes later, they will not remember them. They just Mm -hmm. won't. But if they ask that question and you say, here are my top two strengths. Let me tell you a quick story where each has allowed me to achieve my goal. And you tell a story that paints a vivid picture. There is some chemical reaction that helps them remember it and believe it. And so that's what we train people on to answer the questions in the STAR format. And it's for a situation thinking, action, result. Mm -hmm. Um, And that helps you really crystallize your story and bring your successes to life. And that's critical in interviewing. Absolutely. Because you want to highlight and illustrate through a story, Mm -hmm. you know, the power of the skill and the competency that you can bring to that organization. So let's say you successfully get through an interview. Now comes the dreaded moment of the offer. You know, hopefully you get the offer, but then... yes. um, do you negotiate, you know, especially in this market? And this is a real question that's come up a lot. Um, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate ones who got an offer, but now I'm afraid to negotiate because it's such a horrible bar- market out there. Should I just right. take what's coming my way? It's, you know, I, I wish I could get a level higher or a little bit more in compensation, but I'm afraid to ask. What would you say? Um, so it's a great question. And uh I think women especially sometimes are afraid to negotiate. Men inherently were taught to negotiate early on. Um, But independent of who you are, the first thing I will tell you is I believe anybody who negotiates in a win-lose manner loses, even if they get more money because they walk into a company and people are irritated at them and and they ruffled feathers. So I'm a huge believer in what I call win-win negotiation, And what I counsel people to do is, first of all, when they're getting an offer, be very excited. You know, take down the details, ask them to send you information about benefits, ask them to send you information about relocation, plus the offer letter, and then tell them you'll get back to them in a day or two with questions. Yeah. Then I tell folks, what you want to do now is come up with questions, not negotiations, but just questions that you're not clear on. You know, mm-hmm. help me understand the PTO. When does healthcare begin? Um, 401k matching. Do I am I eligible for that? What's the vesting period? Um, can I talk to the hiring manager to get more information about the actual role? All of those informational questions. Mm-hmm. Then, Nikki, when you want to accept. What I tell people to do is think about what they want to negotiate, and it can't be a laundry list, you know, one, two, three things. And what you want to do is write them out and then have really good rationale as to why you're asking. So on compensation, it might be, I'm wondering if you can help me on compensation. And the reason is, while I appreciate the offer, I'm due for a raise, in two months. And that's going to give me a three to 5% increase. And as a result, this is really a lateral move. I'm not telling you how to do it, but any help you can give me. So you want to put rationale. And then once you have the rationale written out, you go to them and say, I love the company. I love the job. I love the hiring manager. I so want to be there if you can help me out with a few requests. And then you walk them through it and you don't tell them how to help you out. Mm -hmm. You say, I'd love your help. Here's the rationale. And I really want to make this work. Let's try to figure it out together. And by doing that, you take yourself 
away from being adversarial and on different mm. sides of the table and you put yourself on the same side and you're both trying to achieve the same goal. And even if they come back and say, we can't help because of X, Y, and Z, you've tried, you know you've gotten the greatest offer you're going to, but you've also built goodwill because you negotiated so professionally. Mm. So it, you can't lose going at it that way. And many times you will win in terms of a sign-on bonus or a little more money or a little more vacation, but you've done it in a way that enhances your credibility. Absolutely. I, I think those are some very actionable tips that I think um, anyone can apply as they're going through it because it's really, um, to your point, you're creating a win-win scenario where you're not making it difficult for someone to say no if it really couldn't work out, but they're more likely to say yes because you're solving a problem together. Right. And you're not telling them how to because you don't know what right. levers they can pull. You're right. just saying, I would love help however you right. can do it. And that's a very um, neutral and safe way to do it, even yeah. in bad economic conditions where you've, you're not, you know, really pissing off anyone. You're not right. sort of make a ruffling feathers, if you will, or coming across as someone who seems entitled right from the get go, right? You're right. Just simply presenting, you know, a potential sort of problem solving scenario. Absolutely. So, we get the best offer and we've yes. accepted the offer. Now it's time to begin a new journey. Um, what, are, what is you, you know, you, your biggest advice to someone who is starting off a new career? Because that first 30, 60, 90 days are so critical. And uh, you know, what do you see in people you guide as they're transitioning into new roles and, and new companies? Um, well, Nikki, I'm going to jump into that in a sec. But what, one thing I do want to say is, as you accept, mm -hmm. um, you don't want to tell anybody until the background check uh. and drug screen are taken care of. And then you want to resign in a really professional way because the world is too small. And you want to keep those relationships. When you resign, you want to go to them saying, I have great news and sad news. You mm -hmm. know, the great news is I found a job that's a level higher in my hometown, you know, or whatever. You want to try to hang it on some personal thing that they cannot achieve. Um, but, and the sad news is I'm leaving because I love the company and the people I've worked mm -hmm. with. The other thing I will tell you here is companies sometimes will try to give you a counter offer. They do not work very often. Maybe 10% of the time, usually if somebody accepts a counteroffer, within six months, they're gone because mm -hmm. what motivated them to look in the beginning is still there. So mm -hmm. if they start making noises about counteroffer, I tell people to say, look, I respect you too much. Please don't waste your time with a counteroffer. This is a decision I've made. It's the right thing for me personally and professionally. And I want to stay in touch for the long term and just to stop it before it starts. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to share that because I think that's really important today yeah. more than ever. Yeah, I think, um, you know, not burning bridges and being yes. able to gracefully um, and respectfully exit retaining yeah. the relationships as you begin a new journey. I think that I'm so glad you made that point. Um, so that's how you sort of exit out of your current environment. How do you embark right. onto the new environment? So the new environment, um, one of my clients hired a, a senior VP and they said, for the first 90 days, we want you to treat it as a coffee clutch, meaning you're not going to make decisions and we want you to build relationships in your new mm -hmm. company. I'm not saying don't make a difference and don't add value, but I think those 30, 60 days what is so important is to build relationships and build your knowledge base. So mm -hmm. to set up meetings with all your cross-functional partners, to really align with your manager on what their goals are and what their expectations and how they like to work. So you're really clear on mm -hmm. that. To listen much more than you speak 
Mm -hmm. Initially, I know people who have really irritated new companies when they go there and say, well, at my company, we did it this way and try to enforce their previous learnings on the company versus listening to how the company does it, saying, wow, this is really great. I love X, Y, and Z. We might be able to make it even better because you know this is an element that we used to use, but the rest of what you guys do is awesome. So... Mm -hmm. I really think those are the critical things for getting off on a really good fit is building those relationships, understanding your role and differences you have to make, and then not letting your ego get in the way, being willing to do everything and anything that's needed to move your business forward. Fantastic. Well, Chris, you walked us through the entire life cycle of, uh, you know, someone's career from discovering the right answer for you and figuring out the right path and playing to your strengths and passion to knowing how to make a switch and transition to new opportunities and the right way to prepare yourself. You're, you know, whether you're preparing your resume, preparing for the interview or asking for the offer and how you exit out of gracefully from your current position to how you embark onto the new one. Um, you know, and all of this, you've provided strategic frameworks and, and tactical tips in your book, uh, yep, which yep. is available on Amazon. Uh, and I'd encourage, our, we'll share the links to your book and your website on our, uh, you know, podcast episode page. So encourage our listeners to check out your book, especially at this time. There are a lot of people that need this help. Um, so yes. I'm excited they're able to, you know, get access to this valuable knowledge from you and from your book. Um, but what if they want to go even further? They need more hands-on help beyond the book. Um, you know, yeah. what can they do? Um, well, with the book, we also launched services that address exactly what you're talking about, Nikki. If people go to igniteyourcareerbook.com, we have a website that outlines different services. So we have complete coaching, and this is for somebody who really wants our help figuring out the strategy, you know, figuring out their strengths, figuring out where they might go, all the steps of the way. And then we have resume writing interview prep and negotiation. And we have different levels depending on where somebody is. So if somebody's in a career search, but they're not getting any pickup because their resume is not good, we can help them optimize their resume. Or if they are getting pickup, but they're bombing in the interviews, we can do mock interviews and help them mm -hmm. course correct and identify where their issues are and where they need to practice. Um, and then many people are getting offers and they're getting offers without the assistance potentially of a recruiter. They got in through networking or whatever, but they don't know how to negotiate and they want somebody in their corner. And so we can get on the phone really quickly and take them through the process and actually write it out with them and help them formulate their thought process. So we offer all those services um, and it's myself and my team, recruiters who have been doing this for 20 years with people everywhere from CEOs, CMOs, all the way down. Um, so excellent. Well, these are resources that are so needed, um, especially yeah. during this time when so many people are, um, you know, really not only actively looking, but um, struggling to find the right quality support. So I'm uh, thankful to you for coming on the show and being generous with sharing your expertise and your wisdom and guidance to everyone out there. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about the impact you create through the book you just launched. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's been delightful talking with you. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting-edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.